Welcome to Straight Scripture, No Sugar. Uh, this is a series of sermons I'm going to do which is going to give you the Word of God directly from the Bible and not a bunch of uh, superficial emotions and not a bunch of things that you want to hear, not a bunch of things that are going to make you feel warm and fuzzy and comfortable. I'm just going to give you the Word of God, you know. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free, John 8, 32. Uh, Christ himself said in John 17, 17, Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. So essentially I'm going to give you what God says directly and not a bunch of opinions that are going to send you to hell. So this is for those people. There's going to be a lot of people who don't like what I have to say, who hate what I say, who are going to curse me, not agree with me, but this isn't about opinion. This is about truth. Scripture says over and over and over again that the Word of God is the truth, so that's what I'm going to give you. I mean, how do you know in which direction you're supposed to go if you're getting 20 different opinions from 20 different people all the time? The world is about opinion, but the Word of God is about truth, so that's what I'm going to give you. Straight Scripture, no sugar. I'm not going to give you warm and fuzzy platitudes. I'm not going to do something that's going to put you on, a remo on an emotional high for 15 minutes. Uh, and then have no eternal or everlasting value in something that isn't going to help you at all, but just is going to put you on a foundation of sand that's going to send you to hell. I'm going to tell you the truth straight from Scripture, and if you don't agree with what I say, that's fine. Curse me out, laugh at me, spit in my face, whatever you want to do. But the truth of the matter is, if you check what I say against the Word of God, because I'm going to give you Scripture, you will find that it holds true. So anyway, I hope to do a whole series on this. Uh, straight scripture, no sugar, and this is my first uh, edition. It's called The Proverbial Fool. This is going to be focused on the fool uh, from Proverbs, and the fool is mentioned over and over in scripture, but I'm just going to talk about the fool in Proverbs. Now, if you know a fool, typically, you know, what is a fool in terms of our worldly definition? Well, a fool is somebody who's always clowning around, who's always joking, who's never serious. You know, in medieval times, a fool was also called a jester, which would be somebody who would entertain a king with jokes or with antics or, or what have you. And if somebody's, you know, joking with you or flicking your ears or running around in circles and laughing, you might say, get away from me, you fool. What's your problem, you fool? You know, it's basically, we always consider a fool as somebody who's joking or laughing. Um, if you look in a good uh, dictionary definition of a fool, a fool is somebody who lacks good sense or good judgment or understanding. And that's absolutely correct. That aligns itself with scripture. But in, in the Bible, the fool is somebody who is far more insidious and far more dangerous. So let's listen to a few of these proverbs. Um, Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. That's Proverbs 1.7. Um, basically, a fool is somebody who, who can't learn, can't be taught everything. Somebody who knows it all and is impossible for them to ever acquire any more knowledge or to learn. They can't, they can't be taught. And, you know, this is typical. You, know, you want to see the picture of this. It's like a child. A child who demands everything and wants everything exactly the way that they want it, and they can't be taught anything. You know, a spoiled brat. Unbelievable. That's that's exactly what they're like. They're like rebellious punks in school who have an assignment and they know it all, and or they cheat in their exam to get ahead. They can't learn anything because they know it all. That is a biblical fool. Uh, here's another one. Every prudent man acts with knowledge but a fool lays open his folly. That's Proverbs 13, 16. Um, you know, if you know a wise person or somebody who is trying to follow the right path in life, they're always interested in learning more and, and trying to stay on course. But a fool is just constantly flapping their gums, constantly yapping, constantly gossiping, and all that comes out of their mouth is, is a bunch of stupidity and and nonsense. It has nothing to do with, with truth or what's right or, or what they should do or what they're supposed to do. You know, a worldly definition would be somebody who's wayward. You know, a wayward person is somebody 
who's interested in fulfilling their own desires or their own needs and has no desire whatsoever to follow the righteous path or to do what is expected or what is right. Um, here's another one. Those who trust in themselves are fools, but those who walk in wisdom are kept safe. That's Proverbs 28, 26. Uh, that's another issue. Because of our fallen nature as sinners, we do not innately know what is true or what is right or what is wrong or what decision we should make that's going to take us along the right path. All we think about is satisfying and gratifying our own desires, not you know, doing what we're supposed to do or doing what's even good for us. The fool is just interested in instant gratification, getting their way, I want it my way, my way or the highway, that kind of thing. Um, and here's a fourth one here about the ignorance and unteachability of the fool. Though you grind a fool in a mortar, grinding them like grain with a pestle, you will not remove their folly from him or from them. And that's Proverbs 27, 22. And the idea there is, you know, you can beat a fool into submission. You can punish them over and over and over again. But they're not interested in anything but, but doing their own thing and getting their own way. I mean, that's, that's all they care about and they can't be corrected. Uh, it's a sad truth, but I'm sure, you know, you have known many people like this in your life and and when I was lost, I was like that. You know, I just wanted my way and, you know, it didn't matter how much I was punished or how much I was scolded or how much I was admonished. It would just, I would just find another way to try to get my own way or try to go around the authority figures in my life like a fool, which, you know, was pretty much what I was before I was saved. Um, so the other aspect of a foolish person is uh, they are wayward, you know, which I have already touched on, which is they're interested in following their own path and their own direction as opposed to what is right or what is expected. Um, here's the first proverb about that. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but the wise listen to advice. That's Proverbs 12:15. Um, again, that kind of gets back to what we were talking about in Proverbs 1, 7, about the fool um, hating wisdom and instruction. You know, a wise person, somebody who wants to know the right way and somebody who wants to know what's best for them and, and best for the people around him is going to listen to advice and listen to uh, people who have knowledge and people who have wisdom and is going to be teachable and guidable. But a fool is just like, oh, I, I know the right way. I know what's right. Who are you to tell me what's right or wrong? You know, it's all about me. It's not about you. Um, you know, what is wisdom? Wisdom is knowledge of what is true, what is right, and what is lasting. You know, following your own fallen instincts and own desires to get your way is not wisdom. That's foolishness or folly. Okay, here's the next one. The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way, but the folly of fools is deceit. Proverbs 14.8. Um, again, this kind of adds more detail. The idea is fools believe lies. They believe things that are totally and completely untrue. The folly of fools is deceit. They're not interested in what is right, and they're not interested in the truth, and they're being lied to, and ultimately who's behind the lies? The devil. The devil is the liar and the father of all lies. Jesus himself said that. Um, so you have to know what forces are behind all of this to really understand which path you're supposed to follow. Um, it says in Ephesians 6.12, we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but with powers, with principalities, with the rulers of this dark age, uh, dark age, with the powers of, um, in the wicked places. You know, the idea is there's a spiritual force behind all these lies that is misleading us, and particularly is misleading the fool because the fool is ignorant. Um, and that's that's the devil. Proverbs 19:3. The foolishness of a man twists his way, and his heart frets against the Lord. So the idea here as well is the fool is living in ignorance. The fool is, the fool is living in instability. The fool lacks wisdom, 
So his way is twisted. It's the world which is basically telling him to follow all of his fallen instincts and all of his, all his fallen desires. Do this, do that, do that, do the other. Do whatever satisfies you. Do whatever makes you happy. It doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. It doesn't matter if it hurts other people. If it doesn't matter if it sends you to hell. Hey, if it makes you happy, do it. You know, and that's foolishness. And that twists his way. And then ultimately when the fool starts to experience all sorts of adversity and trouble in his life, which is essentially the hand of God punishing him, he frets against the Lord. Fret means to be visually anxious or worried. And, you know, basically people who shake their fists against God, oh, I want my way, or forget it, why you're supposed to give me my way, God, what's going on? You know, well, you're acting like a fool and you're acting in sin. That's what's going on, so I'm going to give you trouble. Hebrews 12, 6, the Lord chastises those he loves and punishes everyone he calls a son. I mean, even people who are saved are going to get punished by God, but for the fool, there's all sorts of adversity, and they, they just think God is supposed to serve them because they don't have any knowledge of the truth or any knowledge of righteousness or any uh, desire to obey the path of righteousness. So when they don't get their way, they fret, shake their fist against God. That's just foolishness, the proverbial fool. Okay, the other thing, and probably the most important thing, is that fools are troublemakers. You know, when you think of a typical fool in your life, you might just think of as some sort of clowning idiot that, you know, is there to amuse you. But the biblical fool is someone who is truly, truly dangerous. Uh, listen to this one. A fool finds pleasure in wicked schemes, but a person of understanding delights in wisdom. That's Proverbs 10.23. So, you know... What are, how, what is a typical fool behavior? You know, they're interested in trouble and stirring it up, mixing things up, spreading malicious gossip, backstabbing each other. Um, you know, I experienced all this stuff throughout grade school. I'm not complaining. I'm just saying fools are everywhere in the corporate world as well. I mean, people who, you know, are constantly trying to tell stories and destroy people's names and reputation, create scandal, um, ruin lives through a bunch of idle talk. You know, they're everywhere. They are everywhere. And, and, you know, things that ruin lives are amusing to them. Amusing to them. It's malicious. And it's the way of the fool. Uh, here's another one. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive it from him. That's Proverbs 22.15. So the idea there is, you know, What's a child like? You know, they just want their way. They're ignorant. They're stupid. All they care about is lording their power over everyone, and they want to follow their own fallen way. I mean, it's an interesting, you know, parallel that a, a child is a fool. So many adults behave like spoiled children. There's a very, very strong connection there, and one that is absolutely 100% true. You know, you look at parents who don't punish their children. We live in a day and age where where parents are afraid to punish their children because they don't want to be ostracized and alienated. And what happens? They end up acting like children themselves and they end up raising up these demons who are just completely lawless. You know, Proverbs 13, 24 talks about the need for us to punish our children. He who spares the rod hates his child. He who loves his child is careful to discipline them. Proverbs 13, 24. Or 1 Corinthians 13, 6. Love does not delight in wrongdoing. Love delights in truth. Love is not some sort of spineless pampering and coddling. Love is about aligning people with the righteous path. You know, if you let people do whatever they want and just act like lawless psychopaths, that's not love. That's... Foolishness. <clears throat> okay, here's another one. If a wise person goes to court with a fool, the fool rages and scoffs, and there is no peace. Proverbs 29 9. That's another thing. Can you reason with a fool? No. They reason matters nothing to them. The fool rages and scoffs. Again, spoiled brat behavior, that's a fool. They just want their way, and if they don't get it, they'll scream, and they'll yell, and they'll throw fits, and they'll throw tantrums, and they'll laugh in your face sarcastically. That's a fool. Not interested in, in right and wrong and in the righteous path, but interested in following their own way. That's all they care about. That's all they care about. So, you know, to basically summarize, you know, what is the fool? The fool is somebody who makes trouble. The fool is somebody who is wayward. 
The fool is somebody who wants their own way or forget it. And the fool is somebody who can't be taught, who can't, can't learn. They're unteachable. They can't be taught. Um, so basically, to, to summarize what happens when you are in the company of a fool, here's another proverb. He who walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools suffers harm. Proverbs 13, 20. So if you're spending your time with fools, with people who are only interested in getting their own way and gratifying their own desires and stirring up problems and trouble, ultimately it's going to rub off on you and it's going to ruin your life. So, you know, I've made that mistake many, many times in my past and finally, by the grace of God, I finally understood it. Walk with wise people. Don't spend your time with fools. They're going to ruin your life and they're going to make you unproductive for God. Um, so the next thing I want to say is uh, to give a little gospel presentation. You know, essentially the gospel is the good news and uh, that is essentially the atoning nature of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is the only atonement for sin. Um, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and all fall short of God's glory. There isn't a human being on the planet who is not guilty of sin. And it doesn't matter uh, whether you're a Christian or not. Um, everybody is guilty of it. And anybody who's being honest with themselves will know that they're a sinner because as it says in Romans 2, God gave us a conscience. We all know innately from the time we are born we have an innate sense of right and wrong. Now that can be perverted and corrupted, but initially we all have this sense of right and wrong. And anybody who is being honest with themselves know that they're a sinner. I mean, if you ever lied, cheated, stolen, stolen anything, lusted after somebody else's wife or car or house or whatever, I've done all those things, you know? We've all done all those things, and, and we're all sinners. And if we're being honest with ourselves, we have to, you know, we have to say, yes, that is absolutely correct. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and all fall short of God's glory. Now, there is an atonement for sin. The only atonement for sin is the man who knew no sin. And in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, For our sake he made the man who knew no sin to become sin for us, so in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's essentially the gospel in the nutshell. God takes all of his hatred towards sin. All of his actual, what he despises about it, I mean, he hates it, he, he can only, God demands perfection. You know, no sin can be tolerated. So he takes all of his hatred towards every sin committed by every believer from the cradle to the grave. He takes it and he pours it out on his son on the cross. And because of that, we are now reconciled with God. Reconciliation is about restoring peaceful relationships with. We now have peace with God because God poured out all of his hatred towards sin on his perfect son and because his son never sinned it makes him the only atonement for sin. Um, it also says in Isaiah 53 5 this really crystallizes it. Um, talks about what happened on the cross specifically. He was uh, pierced for our, tra our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Um, the pain or the peace that was on him. All right, I'm messing it up now, but the, uh, give me a second. Uh, the penalty for peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. So the idea is the perfect sacrifice who knew no sin, Jesus Christ, pays the penalty for our sin and is crushed by God on that cross and then that creates healing. That reconciles us to God. That creates peace. So ultimately by being in Christ we have peace with God. You could say well what's going on in Scripture? Jesus is described as the Prince of Peace but he's also described as somebody who brings sword. Jesus himself said, I have not come to bring peace from, but a sword. I have come to separate a man from his father, a daughter from her mother, a daughter-in-law from her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. That's Matthew 10, 34. But in Isaiah 9, 6, Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. So what is it? You know, does he really create peace? Absolutely he does, but he creates peace between God and man. 
because he atones for our sin. He does not create peace between man and man. In fact, he creates division. He creates strife. And why does he create strife? Because men love their sin. You know, you know that very famous uh, scripture that you always hear and see everywhere, which is John 3.16, which says, you know, um, for our sake, uh, wait a minute, what is John 3.16 now? John 3.16 is God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will have eternal life and will not perish. That's absolutely true. You hear that all the time. But what does it say two verses later in John 3.19? Men love the darkness, not the light, because their deeds were evil. So in our fallen nature, we are naturally rebellious. But when we confess Christ as Lord and Savior, we receive the Holy Spirit. And that makes us, gives us the ability to obey. That allows us to obey God and to follow the righteous path. And that brings us a life of eternal repentance as well. So, well, what is the final step to be in Christ? Well, Romans 10, 9. Uh, Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So ultimately, it's that submission to Christ confessing Him as Lord and Savior and believing in your heart that God raised Him from the dead to pay the price for sin. But that is what you have to do. But it's not something that is as simple and superficial as words. It has to be something that is sincere in your heart. You have to truly repent. You have to truly be sorry for your sin. You have to want the righteous Lord to command and direct your life. And you have to have that broken heart, and that's when you receive the new heart and the new uh, spirit through the Holy Spirit. Um, but it has to be something that truly is sincere and believing um, in your nature to have this atonement be sincere. Jesus himself said in Matthew 7.22, on the day of judgment, many will come to me on that day and will say, Lord, Lord, haven't we witnessed in your name? Haven't we cast out demons in your name? Haven't we prophesied in your name? And I will say to them, get away from me. I never knew you practicers of lawlessness. So people who just speak empty words without a truly penitent heart and a broken heart and desire to follow Christ are not going to be going into heaven. And they're going to be shocked and surprised at it because they have all these works and they have all these great things that they've done quote-unquote, in a worldly capacity. I mean, philanthropy is great, but it doesn't create atonement for sin. And that is a big misunderstanding that people have, like, well, I help out. Well, I, you know, I contribute to the needy, and I contribute to the poor, and I do all these good works, and I help the misfortunate. And, you know, that's great. That is good. We are supposed to do good works, but that does not create atonement for sin. And that's a big misconception and misunderstanding. And Ephesians 2.8 says, it is by grace through faith that you have been saved, not by acts. It is a gift of God so that no one may boast. It is faith. It is faith in Christ as your Lord and Savior that saves you. It's not what you do. So that's the end of my first little sermon, uh, The Proverbial Fool. I plan on doing a whole series of these, and God willing, I will be able to do a whole series. I want to say thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And if those of you are not in Christ, I hope this will give you an opportunity to come to Him. And those who are already Christians, I hope this will edify you and, uh, and build you up. So I'm going to offer a little prayer of thanksgiving here. Uh, thank you, Father, for this opportunity to share this little mini-sermon about the proverbial fool on the Internet. And thank you for giving me a tool that makes it so easy and convenient to share your Word. And I pray that this will help build people up and help people... Uh, come to your son. Uh, in Christ's name, amen. So thanks again. This has been Straight Scripture, No Sugar. Uh, my name is John Parisi. God bless you. Amen.